Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. We will start in uh, one minute. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate the level of interaction between you. Ladies and gentlemen here at the hall and uh, on your screens because we can hybrid. Uh, good evening. Welcome to this year's uh, Global Economy Lecture, which has been organized by the Österreichische Nationalbank together with the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies. Let me warmly welcome uh, the speaker, Professor Sergei Gurgiev. Sergei, great pleasure having you here. And uh, we look forward uh, to the contributions uh, to enhance our understanding on the political economy of Putin's war in Ukraine. And I can see from the number of people here, it's almost packed here, that's a topic which is interesting for all and which uh, fairness us all. So our uh, expectations are pretty high, just uh, that you are warned here. Uh, Sergei is certainly one of the most well-known and renowned experts on the Russian economy. As a Russian, he was able to observe and analyze the country from the inside and now for the outside, because since uh, 2030, he was compelled uh, uh, to migrate, and he got uh, and uh, gained further prominence uh, in the West as a critical and engaged uh, uh, knowledgeable person, scientist, deciphering the often complex developments in Russia and uh, in the Russian economy, and uh, which of course gained their dynamism starting out in 2014, as we all know, uh, with the annexation of Crimea. Uh, but uh, Sergei's uh, purview is not limited only to economic issues. He also has a very strong view and uh, analytical view on the authoritarian tendencies uh, uh, around President Putin, something I think uh, we already want to know all about, I'm sure, all in our discussions with friends within the family. One of the streaks question is, you know, would uh, it have changed if we had engaged with Putin earlier, or would it have ended up whatever we're doing? I think this is one of the key questions, and uh, this is how to say one of your deliverables today. I want to have an answer on this one, if I may have asked for. Now, uh, when Russia invited uh, Ukraine in February 22, I think uh, we all were a shock. I recall vividly what has happened. I was on a flight uh, to Paris uh, uh, in uh, was the French presidency, so we were meeting the Minister of Finance. Uh, but of course, the whole day we talked about nothing else than about what does it mean uh, for us, uh, for the European Union, for the Euro, for our economic uh, economic. Uh, uh, future, and I have to say, we we talked a lot, we raised a lot of issue, but going back now, my sense is we caught perhaps 20% uh, of what has happened since then, which showed how to say how limited our knowledge, our capacity to predict was then. Now, given the sheer dimensions of suffering destruction, one of the questions worth uh, considering is, of course, what behi lies behind the Russian aggression? Is it something which was given for me historically since the time of even the terrible uh, coming uh, through uh, Alexander and the aggression and the Silk Road? Just over Christmas, I had the opportunity to read a book about it, and it, uh, some of the arguments sounded like they were coming out of yesterday. Though. But uh, turning a bit further on to the implications, uh, what impact will have this humanitarian calamities massive refugees flows and destruction of important infrastructure on the political developments in the neighboring countries, but also in Russia and in Ukraine. And what does it mean once this is over with regards to how shall we help uh, to come back to normality? Uh, obviously, it's much too early to assess the longer term regional economic consequences of this war. And I'm sure today some of us will venture of some of this uh, hypothesis uh, because the war, unfortunately, there's no end in sight. 
But still, in my opinion, one of the crucial questions is whether the war and the sanction will result in a bipolar world, on the one hand reaching from uh, uh, a border close by to the Pacific, and the rest uh, of the world, uh, at least uh, North America and Europe, uh, together, or is this something which can be uh, prevented and uh, uh, one may at this time for the West uh, to think about how to engage with a defeated Russia. And uh, this is what Pavel K. Bayev put recently in a Brookings publication. So, uh, with no further ado, with against this backdrop, we're all looking towards a very, very interesting evening uh, uh, to a number of insights. We start out uh, uh, with this presentation. And, uh, but before doing that, I hand over to Robert Scherer. He's the scientific director of the Vienna Institute uh, for his opening remarks and I wish us all intellectually stimulating evening. Thank you very much. Well, dear the governor, uh, Holtzmann, uh, Professor Gurev, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me also welcome you uh, to this event. So many thanks already for this introductory speeches, laying out the main questions, and also pointing out to the shock, basically, we all had uh, when the invasion started almost one year ago. Uh, and I think we still feel quite strongly a strong discomfort when hearing about the sufferings and the uh, destructions still ongoing in Ukraine, uh, which will, of course, be to be discussed today. Uh, let me also let me thank, first of all, uh, Governor Holtzmann uh, and the National Austrian National Bank uh, for always cooperating on this Global Economy Lecture, uh, which has been started in 1999. Um, actually, it's the Global Economy Lecture of 2022, because we haven't won last year, and this is the one we had to postpone, and we have it <laughs> this year. Um, I would also like to thank uh, my colleague here at the National Bank, Ma Maria Silgona, who is always very supportive in making this cooperation uh, ongoing. Uh, at this stage, I also would like to thank the Central uh, European University in the kind of cooperation, because Ser Sergei has been at in Vienna on invite of the Central European uh, University, and we borrow, so to say, uh, him <laughs> for this global economy uh, lecture. Um, well, as already said, well, uh, Professor Gurev is one of the best known experts in Russian economics and politics. Um, just to give a glimpse on, of, of his CV, he studied at various institutions in Russia, the Moscow University Institute of Physics and Technology before 1993, uh, the Russian Academy of Science, uh, from which he graduated in 2002. Uh, already then, he had some affiliations with institutions in France, with Sciences Po, and London uh, in, uh, with CPR. Uh, well, as we have already heard, in 2014, he has to leave Russia, uh, and then he became professor of economics at Sciences Po in Paris, uh, which is still his current affiliation. Uh, other affiliations include the New Economic School in Moscow, where he acted as a professor and also rector, uh, the European Bank for Re Reconstruction Development, where he held the position of the chief uh, economist, and he has also been visiting assistant professor at Princeton University some years ago, uh, just to mention a few of his affiliations over uh, his uh, uh, CV. Well, his main fields of research include issues of labor mobility, contract theory, corporate governance, economics of development and transition, and of course, political economics, which is uh, his main field uh, nowadays. Uh, he always, in all his fields, he published in a wide range of renowned journals and contributed to a number of books with uh, kind of uh, numerous articles. Uh, particularly last year, at the very end of the last year, he, together with uh, Daniel Dreisman, published this very interesting book uh, uh, on spin dictators, the changing face of tyranny in the 21st century, which I had the pleasure to read over my Christmas <laughs> uh, holidays. Uh, so this is a very interesting book, and I, I guess you will anyway come back to uh, the contents of this in, in, your, in your lecture. Uh, so this gives a, a glimpse of uh, his uh, um, uh, of the background of uh, Professor Gurev and why he's the most renowned person speaking on this particular topic uh, uh, today. Um, 
Before passing over, just a few organizational words. Um, it is uh, organized as a hybrid event, so and it is recorded. Um, after the lecture, which will take about 30, 45 minutes, uh, so there will be room for discussion, which is organized in the following way. The discussion uh, will be led by my colleague and former scientific director at the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies, Michael Landesmann, uh, who basically was the one who was inventing this global economics uh, lecture series. Um, and for those attending online, uh, there is the possibility, possibility that you pose your questions in the chat function, and I will sit on the computer and try to summarize and communicate these uh, uh, questions from the chat function during the discussion in interaction with, with Michael. So this is the way uh, this lecture will be organized. Having said this, uh, let me give the floor to Professor Gurev on his presentation on the political economy of Putin's war in, in Ukraine. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for generous introduction, for invitation. Thank you very much, Governor Holtzman. Thank you very much, former Governor Novotny. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Michael. So I will um, <clears throat> talk uh, um, for about uh, um, 40 minutes, and I will not be able to answer all questions during the talk, but we'll have time for uh, uh, your questions. So uh, as uh, uh, Roberts mentioned, uh, I do research on the nature of stability and legitimacy and survival of authoritarian regimes. And that's why I want to start with this graph, which can tell you a story of uh, what's happened to Putin's popularity and why. And uh, one of the things we do with uh, my co-author Dan Trisman in this book, but also in papers on which we base this uh, book, is we show that uh, popularity of authoritarian regimes matters. Modern, majority of modern authoritarian regimes care about their popularity, they measure their popularity, and they think about how to maintain it because with, if they don't want to resort, resort to repression, they resort to manipulation of information to create this image of a competent uh, leader and maximize this popularity. So this is a Putin's popularity rating throughout his regime until December 2022. Uh, measured by uh, Levada Center, which is a reasonably uh, independent uh, polling agency, I would immediately say that polls during 2022 are probably not very reliable. Still, I, I think that if you look at this graph, you see a lot of things. You see that initially Putin's popularity was uh, uh, already high. Uh, that was a social welfare benefits reforms 2005, so it collapsed. Then economic growth maintained, it's a very high level, you see 80% popularity. Um, uh, and uh, uh, th there is a paper by my co-author which actually shows that there is a correlation between economic performance and uh, Putin's popularity. The fact that popularity was very high is because economic growth was unprecedentedly high. The first decade of Putin's in po Putin in power was a 7% growth popularity, then his popularity was coming down as economic growth was coming down. Um, and uh, then he saw this opportunity of Crimea, he grabbed Crimea, and it probably worked even beyond his expectations. Why I'm saying this? Because this episode, I think, is very critical for understanding why he did what he did in 2022. Now, you see this decline in popularity in 2010, 11, 12, as economic growth was going down, as Putin's economic model based on corruption, centralization of power, intervention by the state and uh, his uh, friends in the economy was uh, destroying Russian economic growth. Uh, his popularity was coming down, came down to 60, and then Crimea helped to increase it further. Uh, so after Crimea, his popularity was at 90, and so uh, life was good for Putin. Uh, and then uh, it started to come down because of uh, uh, raising retirement age, because of uh, pretty successful anti-corruption campaign and uh, social media campaigns of the opposition. And so his popularity came down to 60 again. And so he thought that it's time to do something like 2014, something like Crimea. And so I'll keep coming back to this graph uh, during my talk, but just to have in mind that Putin was facing a major issue. His uh, approval rating was as low as ever before this war, and that worried him. So 
Uh, the, why am I talking about this? Because we have this book indeed, which uh, shows that most of modern um, um, non-democratic regimes are regimes based not on open repression, but on uh, uh, manipulation of information. Uh, these are spin dictators who are majority of today's dictators and not fear dictators. And that's the history of Putin before one year ago. So uh, on the cover, we show this in one picture, which is you can see how we transition from 20th century model based on terror. These are the dictators. I will not bother you with this, but uh, basically whenever I talk about this book, I show uh, the images of uh, 20th century dictators. They all wear military uniform. Now most dictators wear uh, civil, uh, civilian suits, go to Davos, uh, talk to central bankers, foreign investors, and uh, present themselves as Democrats. So that was Putin's model until a year ago. Now, uh, what is important to understand that economic growth was going down and uh, income growth in particular, I'll show you a graph on this, was disappointing. And that, of course, contributed to this fall in popularity that worried, worried Putin a lot. Why it was the case? Because the model was based on corruption. Corruption is a feature and not a bug of regimes like this. I'm happy to talk more about this if you have questions. But uh, in general, uh, the microeconomic situation in Russia was pretty bad, and that contributed to slow economic growth. Um, if you look at investment to GDP ratio, it was at the range of 20, 22 uh, percent of GDP. Uh, Putin re uh, repeatedly said we need 25, 28, 27. He actually issued orders to increase investment, but instead he had capital outflow about 4 percent per year. Instead, macroeconomic situation was actually quite rob sorry, robust. Uh, there was what's called Fortress Russia, macroeconomic fortress Russia, which had several pillars. And again, going forward into 2022, we need to understand what happened before 2021. And basically, the, the macroeconomic framework was based on balanced budget with a fiscal rule, which said if oil price is above $44 per barrel, the extra money goes into sovereign wealth fund, where already uh, he's, uh, he saved 12% of GDP. Now, very large currency reserves, 40% of GDP, very low debt. Um, much of this debt was domestic. Only 5% of, of GDP of sovereign debt was external. Uh, corporate external debt was only 30% of GDP. So the situation was quite, uh, uh, quite good from the point of view of fiscal and uh, uh, external balances. In 2014, Russia finally moved to a flexible exchange rate and inflation targeting. So something which happened in December 2014 when a ruble uh, fell dramatically and that resulted in certain uh, 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 kind of panic. That's uh, no longer a problem, uh, looked like in 2021. And then banking system was cleaned up in the last 10 years uh, and recapitalized. So Putin's idea was that he can afford a lot when he moves into the war, because macroeconomically he uh, was not vulnerable to uh, uh, macroeconomic uh, turmoil, because he had, he, had, he had protections. Now, just to show you uh, several graphs uh, about this, just to back up what I just said very quickly, I've written a paper why Russia is not a South Korea. A lot of people thought that uh, South Korea is a good model for Russia. Uh, and, in t and indeed, until 10 years ago, you could actually compare Russia and Korean GDP per capita path. And you see they're very similar, right? And you would say that Russia follows South Korea with uh, uh, 11 years lag. But when 10 years ago we wrote this paper, we said it's not going to last because Russian b growth model is based on corruption, is not attracting investment, is not based to move into post-industrial knowledge, uh, uh, knowledge intensive sector, so Russia will slow down, and that's exactly what happened in the last 10 years. Russia stopped growing. In a sense, uh, when 10 years ago we wrote this paper, people told me this joke that Putin and Medvedev have, uh, have an argument, uh, have no argument. They know exactly that they need to move to the Korean model. The problem is they cannot agree uh, whether it should be a uh, South Korean model or North Korean model. And I think uh, on this chart, it's still not North Korea. But what's happening this year may already be something like North Korea. Now, one of the things I would show to you is uh, what I said is income growth. You see that uh, when Putin uh, invaded um, 
uh, invaded uh, Crimea, that was the high uh, point of Russian uh, household income. And since then, uh, income started to go down. And uh, the, in 2020, it was about 10 percentage points below the peak in real terms. Now, the data for 2021 may actually be unreliable. That's a different question. Uh, and they were just recently uh, published. It's already published in 2022. So uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure about this point. But this part of the graph was very well understood by Russian public. And you would always hear that, yes, we have Crimea, but incomes are still below 2013. And that's a very important part of what I was just talking about, which eventually drove Putin's popularity down and uh, uh, created this need for something else. I cannot increase your incomes. I need to do something else. Now, um, one other thing is the global positioning. This stagnation meant that in terms of BRICS, Russia uh, was actually lagging behind, not just uh, in, uh, not just China, but also India is a share of global GDP. You can see that uh, Russia was not doing well in terms of share of global GDP. Well, China was growing fast in the last 10 years. Russia actually fell behind India and continued to lag behind. And finally, and that was very interesting, and this is part of this macroeconomic uh, uh, fortress Russia. If you look at pre-war IMF fiscal outlook, uh, you see that Russia already thought that we will go to fiscal uh, austerity because we want to maintain this, uh, um, maintain this um, fortress Russia, and we care about fiscal stability rather than, uh, rather than economic growth. Even when the whole world, the, the rest of the world, was recovering from uh, COVID and tried to use supportive fiscal stance, this is not what Russia, uh, Russia was doing. Russia was actually thinking that being independent of uh, uh, financial markets is more important. So just to sum up once again, so this is the episode in which uh, Putin saw his uh, popularity going up to very high levels, and he is almost in the same position before the war. He's thinking what's, what's to be done. And essentially, if you look at this graph, you think that it has actually worked in terms of popularity. The reason, the difference is that uh, in uh, this particular case, it's a spin dictatorship still. You could still had, uh, have independent media, some opposition, opposition leader was uh, under house arrest, uh, sometimes harassed, but not still poisoned and not in jail for nine years. Uh, another opposition leader was still not killed. Um, and uh, in 2022, these polls are being conducted under very repressive uh, political regime. So I'll talk about that later. But in general, in general, this is, this is uh, the economics of what has happened. Now, one other element, think, when Putin was thinking about, uh, about uh, uh, what to do in February 2022, was the potential impact of sanctions. And uh, uh, we now know that Western leaders would call Putin and tell him, look, we'll do something really horrible to Russian economy. And uh, he probably did not believe them because he looked at his economy and the studies uh, which showed that the impact of 2014 sanctions, it was important impact. And I think uh, the sanctions of 2014 actually stopped further expansion of uh, Putin's aggression in the east of Ukraine and also uh, put in place the Minsk agreements. Uh, still, if you actually look at the impact on GDP, we are talking about 1% of GDP spread over five years. So it's not, whatever studies we look at, we don't see catastrophic impact of those sanctions. So Putin thought, maybe I'll do something like this. Maybe something like this happened to me, but it's, it's okay. So um, that is uh, one other under, under appreciation of uh, what has actually happened in 2022 by Putin. Now, sanctions in 2022, were much bigger, and certain sanctions were actually unprecedented, and certain sanctions um, uh, created such a, were so unprecedented that expectations were unrealistic. Actually, before the sanctions already, uh, ruble and stock prices lost value because certain sanctions were already priced in before the war. So before the war started, you remember for about half a year, Putin was bringing uh, arm, uh, armed uh, vehicles, armies, uh, soldiers, uh, mobile hospitals, even mobile crematoria to uh, areas around Ukraine. 
and uh, the markets were nervous, and so that was already an impact. But nobody expected what actually happened. So when people thought uh, what can happen, people thought that what well, would be a nuclear, uh, a nuclear weapon, which is switching off Russian banks from SWIFT. Actually, the West went much further. The biggest banks are completely blocked, not just switched off uh, from SWIFT. But what's, what's most important, Russian Central Bank was sanctioned on the day three of the war. And not just by US, but also by Europe. And uh, these sanctions were joined by Switzerland. And so all of that, all of that created a major, major issue for Russia, because suddenly uh, Russian ruble, which was backed by those reserves, uh, became, uh, went into a free fall. Now, eventually, uh, that, um, uh, that free fall was stopped and even reversed, and I'll talk about that a little bit. But basically, uh, what we need to bear in mind is we would never expect this. And the very fact that those reserves were, majority of them were in dollars and euros, shows that the central bank itself did not expect this. And so this very fact suggests that these uh, uh, sanctions were unprecedented. And whatever happened right after introduction of these sanctions was all also, uh, also something which was unexpected. Now, another unexpected thing was voluntary exit of about a thousand of biggest international companies. So once again, America, Europe introduced sanctions on uh, technology, on military or dual use uh, goods. But the real impact on Russian economy was because uh, Russia cannot now import a lot of stuff from Europe, from America, from G7 countries. Uh, trade with those countries has come down by about a third or 40%, depending on how you count. So this is a huge, huge impact, and this is something, again, we've never seen. A big economy connected to the world economy suddenly becomes disconnected to half of the global economy, half of its trading partners. And so that, of course, also created an unexpected shock. And interestingly, uh, you have this strange disequilibrium. So you sanctioned imports, but not exports. Exports were only sanctioned in December. Oil sanctions, whatever we talk about, they were announced in uh, end of May, beginning of June, but they were introduced only on December 5th. And I'll talk about that uh, later. But whatever people say that Europe introduced sanctions on Russian oil and gas, the truth is Europe has never introduced sanctions on Russian gas. That was Putin who stopped exporting gas. And uh, uh, Europe has only started sanctioning Russian oil in December. Now, uh, however, this panic in the beginning of uh, the war uh, due to the introduction of uh, sanctions on the reserves, created those forecasts uh, of minus 8 or minus 10 percent. So if you actually look at various forecasts uh, in April or March or even May, you end up with those numbers. And the Russian government itself, the Central Bank of Russia, expected minus 8 percent in 2022. And so that would be the worst recession since early 1990s. And uh, that would be much lower, of course, than pre-war forecasts of plus 3%. So Russian economy, like all other economies, w was recovering from, from uh, uh, COVID. And so it predicted plus 3%. Actually, with the oil prices we observed in 2022, Russian economy, which, which should have been growing at even higher rate, probably at 5%. But uh, in reality, already in the spring, the forecasts were much lower. Now, today, the situation is different, and so the official uh, forecast of uh, GDP fall in 2022 is minus 3%. Uh, the uh, international organizations talk about 3.5%, uh, but they also say that, uh, that uh, the recession will continue next year. And so the total fall will be in the range of uh, 5 or 6%. And uh, if that happens, if you compare plus three and minus six, you suddenly arrive at a uh, very, painful, uh, very painful cost, but not a catastrophic cost. Russian economy is functioning. Uh, a lot of goods you cannot just buy, but there is no hunger, there will be no hunger, and Russia, uh, Russian households' incomes are at most 10% down. So uh, another thing, and this is uh, a very interesting uh, very interesting thing which happened is a ruble is 
actually stronger. In beginning of December, before oil sanctions, ruble was stronger than before the war. And a lot of people saw this as an indication that Russia is doing very well. And this is, a, of course, a wrong conclusion. Ruble is strong because imports are sanctioned and exports are not. So you suddenly have uh, lower demand for dollars because you don't have ways to spend those dollars. So dollars suddenly become weaker and the rubles become stronger. On top of that, there are certain constraints on capital movement. Uh, Russia actually stopped convertibility of the ruble. Uh, Russia froze in the beginning of the war. Russia froze uh, uh, withdrawal from banks. And actually, when people say it's a genius uh, uh, monetary policy or prudential regulation policy, I would like to remind you one thing which people don't realize. If a year ago you asked me, what happens if Russian government comes up and says, your currency deposits will be converted to rubles at a given rate, and some currency deposits, will not, you will not be able to take them out of the banks? I would expect that would be a mass protest. And it's not a political, it's an economic protest, and everybody would understand that that's impossible to do. However, the internal political repression made this protest impossible, and that's, for, uh, that's why certain uh, uh, banking regulations could actually work. Anyway, this is, uh, this is something I would show you uh, regarding the ruble. Uh, a lot of people would say a ruble, a ruble is very strong, but if you actually think about this, if you trace the relationship between ruble and, uh, and oil price, you see that they kind of go in parallel. Uh, but then as escalation was, uh, escalation was increasing in uh, 2021, oil price was growing while uh, ruble was not catching up with the oil price. Then it did jump and they started to come down, but essentially it is a long-term gap between uh, equilibrium relationship between ruble and oil. So ruble is stronger than, uh, than uh, in the beginning of the war. However, uh, ruble is much weaker than the long-term prediction given this oil price. Why? Because, of course, we have a huge capital outflow. Uh, so uh, talking about overall narrative that Russian economy is doing well and minus 3% recession is not really a big deal, I would mention several things. One is something that I already talked about, unprecedented sanctions, therefore unrealistic expectations. Yes, we know that if sanctions like this are imposed on Iran and Venezuela, you have a uncontrolled inflation. Uh, however, Russian central bank is just more competent. It just knows that uh, uh, if you want to control inflation, you can. And that's exactly what happened in 2022. Um, uh, the other thing is high oil prices. So essentially, with those oil prices, minus 3% is a big, big recession. So all previous recessions in Russia happened when oil prices went down. When oil prices are at this level, Russia should have grown, and not just 3%, but as I mentioned already, uh, uh, already before, probably more. There is, because of that, sanctions on imports, no sanctions on exports, you have a huge oil, uh, you huge oil revenue and huge current account surplus. So uh, these are the data on uh, current account surplus. So the line here shows you current account, the yellow bars show you trade surplus. The other bars are, uh, are uh, other transactions. Uh, and basically you see that we are talking about uh, 200, these are just three quarters, uh, January to September in 2022 relative to other comparable periods in previous years. That's never happened, and it's pretty much double of the previous peak. We are talking about $250 billion of current account surplus predicted by the end of the year. Uh, it may or may not be true because December, as I will mention later, was really special because of oil sanctions. But still, if you, if you are coming towards December, you, you face a very interesting intellectual challenge. Central bank has $300 billion reserves frozen. On the other hand, during the year, Russia gets $250 billion trade surplus. So Russia lost $300 billion, but Russia also just got uh, 250 because of uh, oil revenues. So that is, uh, that is a, an important argument to remember. Finally, 
We use GDP as a measure of economic performance, but it's not necessarily a correct measure during the war. If you think about this, during the war, uh, I produce a lot more artillery shells, a lot more munitions. Is that good as a measure of quality of life? Of course not. You uh, send those shells to the front line, they destroy Ukrainian cities, they kill Ukrainians. Does it help quality of life of ordinary Russians? The answer is probably not. And if you actually look at whatever non-classified indicators still remain, uh, you can look at uh, uh, retail turnover in comparable prices, year on year, retail turnover is 10% down. So that's a good measure. Russians consume 10% less. Um, if you look at non-oil taxes, 9% decline year on year. Huge, huge difference, right? And uh, that shows you that uh, uh, not all, not all uh, measures are, are uh, working equally well during, uh, during the war. So, um, uh, so what's going to happen next? So a year ago, we had a lot of uncertainty. Now we also have a lot of uncertainty. So it's very hard to make predictions. Uh, however, uh, oil sanctions are in place, and oil sanctions are working. This is very, very important. So oil sanctions today are full embargo by the West, more, more or less full. Hungary is still being part of EU, and NATO still imports Russian hydrocarbons. But uh, um, pretty much Russia sells pretty much no oil and gas to Europe. Just to give you one number, starting 10 days ago, Germany consumes zero Russian gas, zero Russian oil, zero Russian coal. Germany, like Austria, was highly dependent on Russian gas. More than half of um, uh, German gas imports came from Russia before the war. So uh, that's gone, but Russian oil is not disappearing from the market, it goes to other countries. Now, it's more expensive because of transportation, but most importantly, it's subject to oil price cap. How does oil price cap work? US government, European Union, other members of the oil price cap coalitions that includes Australia, Japan, and so on, say, if you, a third country, say India, want to buy Russian oil, we are fine, as long as you pay less than $60. And uh, if you want to circumvent this, we will uh, prohibit uh, insurance of your boats. And on top of that, we'll use secondary sanctions against your oil company. And so when you think about this, and you think about the rationale of Indian oil minister, uh, who says, I need cheap oil for my uh, one and a half billion people who want cheaper fuel, cheaper electricity. Uh, he calls, uh, they call uh, their Russian counterparts and say, dear friends, we love you, and you're, 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 uh, st you standing up to evil West is, uh, is fighting for the right, right cause, but we cannot buy your oil at high price. We will pay you less because otherwise uh, the evil West will go after us. And so average oil price uh, is now traded, uh, that Russia is receiving in December by official Russian statistics, is $50 per barrel. It's actually well below oil price cap. Uh, why is that? Transportation, all kinds of stuff you can think about. Uh, but the discount increased about two weeks before the embargo. Discount between Brent price, European uh, oil price, and Russian price increased substantially two weeks and one week before the oil price cap was actually uh, uh, introduced on December 5th. And so that, of course, hits Russian budget deficit. Now, just to give you a measure of that, today, Ministry of Finance of Russian Federation officially announced that the, um, the uh, overall budget deficit over the year will be 2.3% of GDP, annual GDP. If you look at the data for January to November and compare them to the uh, data January to December, that means in December alone, Russia had a budget deficit of 2.5% of GDP in one month. 2.5% of annual GDP in one month. So right now, Russia is facing a major, major issue. Now, how catastrophic is that? I don't know. Whether Putin will be able to uh, uh, introduce certain austerity measures to reduce uh, pensions and salaries of teachers in real terms, at the same time uh, increasing salaries of uh, policemen and soldiers, uh, we will see. 
to what extent this is sustainable. But today it was introduced that he's uh, increasing salaries of, of uh, policemen. Uh, so that is, uh, that is completely plausible. Now recession, as I said, will continue in 2023. Capital flight, uh, which was huge last, uh, last year, will continue, brain drain will continue. And of course it will have a major negative impact on growth. Let me show you how IMF sees Russian growth uh, before and after the war. So the dotted line is a prediction from World Economic Outlook before the war. The uh, solid line is the most recent prediction by IMF, uh, uh, which is uh, October 2022. And you see that Russian economy will not go back to pre-war levels even in 2026. And the gap between pre-war forecast and uh, recent forecast uh, in 2026 is about 10 percentage points. And uh, we also heard that from U.S. Treasury, I think, no, the Chief Economist of U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce, I think, said that in 2030, Russian GDP will, was 10 percent lower than counterfactual. She meant something like this. Some people heard that, that in 2030, it will, it will, it will be 10 percent below pre-war levels. That's not what she said, and this is not what, what you can see in this graph. No, in 2030, Russian GDP will probably be above pre-war levels, but it, uh, Russia lost about 10% of um, uh, 10 percent uh, relative to counterfactual. Now, what is uh, scary is, of course, politics. Uh, so Russia has completed the, uh, the uh, transition from spin dictatorship to dictatorship based on open repression and fear. Just in the first week of the war, Putin saw how war is unpopular, and all independent media were closed. He introduced open censorship. Before that, censorship was not actually uh, that uh, open, and people didn't understand what they can and cannot say. But in the first week of the war, he introduced the law which said, if you call this war a war, you discredit Russian army. You have to call it special military operation. And if you say the war, and if you say things which are not consistent with the presentation by Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation, you go to jail for several years. And some people are already in jail for this. So that was really, really fast. And uh, they really started to talk about national traitors. For German speakers, of course, it's, uh, it's familiar language. Um, uh, they started to talk about a final solution of Ukrainian question. Again, something uh, familiar to German language speakers. So this is a completely different regime. And so how this regime survives is very hard to uh, predict because we've never seen this regime. And we've never seen such a repressive regime with such a big nuclear arsenal, among other things. However, if Putin loses the war completely, that will be very difficult for him because his popularity, his true popularity is probably down. If we predict popularity based on previous model, looking at economic factors, at repression, uh, we see that it's, it's very unpopular. As we will see more mobilized people killed and uh, wounded, that will also affect the true popularity. But we will not see people on the street because he invests more and more in, in the repression. And so we don't know how long it, uh, it will take. Now, let me uh, talk now speculate about things which are completely uncertain. So the impact on the global economy, uh, we already see a huge impact. So uh, when people say, well, Russia, uh, uh, sanctions against Russia should uh, not, uh, sh should not be introduced right away. We should prepare ourselves. Otherwise, we would go into recession. Now, we now don't predict recession in Europe. It's not the um, base, uh, baseline scenario. Well, some people do, some people don't. But uh, if you look at the prediction of global GDP for 2022 and the uh, factual data, you see a difference of about $1 trillion, right? When you think about this, that this war one year of this war destroyed global GDP of by $1 trillion, that's pretty scary. So uh, the world was in a uh, post-COVID recovery. This recovery is now slower than it could have been. And that will continue next year. So prediction of OECD is that in the first two or three years of the war, global GDP will lose about $3 trillion. That's a lot of money, right? And the sooner this war stops, the better. And in this sense, together with my... Uh, 
former student, uh, Alek Ketzhoki, we actually wrote a number of German language columns in German media uh, when uh, we wrote that you may go into recession. This recession is not going to be deep, as many German economists predicted when they ran the model of calculations of what oil and gas embargo would cost Germany, for example. But it's, it's, it's better to stop this war as soon as possible. And I think if you talk about mistakes, I still think, we don't know, but I still think that the sooner the sanctions were introduced, the less money Putin would have to continue this war. Now, on the other hand, energy market, when you think about energy market, well, we have unusually warm winter, but we, don't, we, we have European gas prices back to pre-war levels. We have grain prices back to pre-war levels. So everybody was scared, uh, but eventually Europe has accomplished this uh, transition. Uh, Europe had about 35-40% uh, of its gas imports coming from Russia. Now this is more like 5-7%. to 7%. Uh, We shouldn't forget that much of the gas which is now in the storage is actually Russian gas. So next winter, winter a year from now, is still not, uh, not an easy case. Yet, as we speak today, the situation is actually much better than Putin thought just half a year, half a year ago. Now, that, was all, that will also accelerate the greening of European economy, because uh, Europe now understands how costly it is to depend on Russian oil and gas. Being within a central bank, I will not talk too much about inflation. Of course, the grain prices and oil prices have contributed to the inflation, but we shouldn't forget that inflation started before the war. And uh, especially in the U.S., you, can, you, you see lots of explanations uh, of U.S. Uh, inflation crisis whenever today U.S. politicians say inflation is because of the war. It, the war has contributed, but uh, certain policy mistakes also did. Now, European Union is stronger than it was. You still have countries like Hungary, which uh, in a very unusual way, uh, we see the, how Orban won an election, uh, even though his uh, friend uh, invaded an Eastern European country. Somehow Hungary is a, is a separate case, but even Hungary supports introducing sanctions. They delay sanctions, but still support introducing sanctions. And I think one of the things that Putin underestimated was the unity of the West. And of course, American leadership is important, but still also unity of the European Union is also important. Now, what we also saw was a major geopolitical cleavage with the global South. So this is something that I'm, I, I'm sure the West did not expect. This is an imperialistic war. There is an empire which tries to uh, reacquire control over a former colony. And yet, somehow Putin managed to convince Global South that this is evil imperial West, which is trying to, um, to attack uh, a victim, Russia. And so, and uh, I, think, I think there are many explanations for this, but one of them is mishandled uh, vaccination policies, which uh, left some southern countries behind a couple of years ago. Uh, but that, that is something that the West needs to rethink, because we now see that unlike 30 years ago, uh, the West is no longer 70% of global GDP, but more like 50. And uh, with that, players like Putin may, uh, may say, Yes, we live badly, but if we can still trade with non-Western countries, we'll probably the sanctions are not that catastrophic. And finally, China. This is extremely interesting uh, challenge, and this is not for me to speculate about this, but on, in economic terms, we see the trade between Russia and China going up, but also between Russia and Turkey. This is a very interesting question. Uh, to what extent... Uh, uh, Turkey may be an important contributor to circumventing sanctions or, um, or uh, mitigating the shock of the sanctions. But anyway, going back to China, before the war it was clear that U.S. has a bipartisan consensus that China is the challenge, is the rival, is, uh, is uh, one of the participants of the future Cold War. And today we are a bit back to 1940s where UK and US had to ally themselves with Soviet Union, not a uh, beacon of democracy, uh, to defeat an even more evil empire. 
And so in that sense, we see sometimes the West manages to convince China to cooperate, maybe threatening by sanctions, uh, maybe, re, re, uh, maybe doing something else, but China does not supply military equipment to Russia. That's very, very important. Russia has to buy military equipment from North Korea and Iran, uh, which tells you a lot. Uh, China doesn't supply uh, cutting edge telecommunications technology. Uh, the Huawei, Huawei company doesn't supply 5G technology to Russia. And so this is also an issue. On the other hand, China and Russia trade a lot. And I think uh, thinking about this is, a, is something, again, to, 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 to have in mind when you discuss future challenges. And finally, whether China uh, uses force to attack Taiwan is anybody's guess. One of the things we learned once again from this war is that dictators make mistakes. I'm pretty sure, again, talking about 2022 as a potential replay of 2014, a typical spin dictator war, uh, re reasonably bloodless and quick uh, annexation of Crimea with a great popularity increase. And Putin thought that he would replay the same in 2022. What did he uh, uh, fail to understand? Unity of the West, as I said, courage of the Ukrainian uh, res uh, resistance, and of course, corruption in his own army. Uh, why didn't he understand that? Exactly because what dictators do, they eliminate critical debate, uh, they don't get uh, feedback, and so they only hear good news from yes men that, uh, uh, that, that uh, surround them. And the same is going to be the case for China. China has broken this year, 2022, has broken the system which served it well for about 40 years with regular rotation of the leadership, meritocracy, and today it's also a personalistic regime. And we already saw a number of policy mistakes uh, of President Xi, uh, including zero COVID policies. And therefore, some people would say China has learned from Ru Russian invasion in Ukraine, and so it will not invade Taiwan. On the other hand, some people would say, Russia has made a mistake invading Ukraine, but that may also mean that China may make a similar mistake because China will say, well, Russia has a corrupt army, our army is great, and so on and so forth. So this, this is something that I would not bet uh, my money on. I think, I think the implication of what has happened in Ukraine for what may happen between China and Taiwan is completely, completely uncertain. Let me stop here and uh, take your questions. Thank you. Ah, okay, <laughs> okay, yeah, okay. Uh, I'll just moderate the discussion. Uh, if there are no questions, I can post questions, but I'll give you the priority, yeah. So probably I'll take two or three uh, together, if you don't mind. Do you want to, something to write? In uh, case I, I have, I have paper, questions. I have yeah. paper. Uh, let's start on this side, yeah. Okay. I'll give it. No, I have yeah? paper. Of course. Uh, Jarko Fidremutz, uh, thank you very much for your very interesting talk. And in the past, we could see that after events like this, uh, there was a breakdown of uh, federations like Yugoslavia, Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, and so on. How likely is that something like this will happen in Russia in the next time? Thank you. Pass it on to the back. Yeah. I have a very simple question. I wonder about the data you have about uh, popularity. If there is a a review in, uh, in a question in Austria. I, I get a phone call. What do you think of the government of doing this or doing that? There can be a, one thing I can be sure. On the other end, is not a security service. How about Russia? Thank you. Just next to you. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, one question on, on this uh, gas uh, question and also on China. Uh, uh, what do you think uh, was Putin underestimating that China would sell its LNG uh, to Europe to help Europe overcome the gas crisis? So he's going to lose also the economic war against the EU. We will take one more in the back row and then we um, your turn. From your economic analysis, for how long can Russia prolong or continue the war in the intensity of seen in 22 
and uh, if it's several years, what uh, should the West do about it? Okay. Thank you very much. These are excellent questions. On disintegration of Russia, I am not sure at all. Nobody knows it is possible. Uh, on the other hand, Russia is a very, Soviet Union was a much more heterogeneous country than Russia. Russia has many ethnicities. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, it's still, a, these ethnicities are a minority. So I think uh, people who recognize themselves as Russians are about 80% of Russian population. The problem is that Russia, we cannot trust Russian census. Russian census was actually f made up two years ago. So it's a, it's a different question. But anyway, there are also, uh, there the, the, the are regions like Chechnya, which are not currently economically sustainable. Uh, there are regions like Tatarstan or Bashkortostan, which are economically sustainable, but landlocked. Uh, there are regions closer to China, which are culturally Russian and European. So it's, it's not clear how this may happen. So it may happen, it's not unlikely, but in principle, it's not clear which parts of Russia will run away from Russia. And uh, it's, uh, it's something that it's very hard to speculate on. It's, it's not impossible, but I, 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 don't, I don't know how to estimate the probability. On popularity. So in, in this book, Spin Dictators, we talk how po to measure popularity in um, non-democratic regimes. And we show that uh, data on from polls are pretty reliable. There is a bias, but this bias is, uh, is quite small. So how do I, do I measure popularity um, in a country where people are afraid to answer the question directly? I can use what's called a list experiments. What is a list experiment? So this is something that political scientists do. So for example, I want to measure popularity of Putin in this room. I, I want to measure how many people approve of Putin. So instead of asking each of you, do you approve of Putin? I ask each of you, for example, randomly I put some people on the left and some people on the right. People on the left are given a list of five people, including Putin. So I'm asking, I'm asking you, how, how, how many of politicians, including, say, Biden, Scholz, Macron, um, uh, and uh, uh, Putin and Zelensky, how many of these do you approve? And so suppose on average, on the left, I get a number 2.4, right? Here, I give you a list of four, Scholz, Macron, Biden, and Zelensky. And on average, I get, I don't know, 1.7. Uh, and then I take the difference and I say in this room, if the room is sufficiently big and the, the split to the left and the right was random, I can statistically say that average is 70%. So this is a measure where, uh, which gives you an average level of support without asking each individual, do you support Putin or not? So th these experiments have been done in countries like Russia and in Russia in particular uh, before the war and it shows that the bias is not really big. Now, when we, uh, if you ask me a question, what would be the level of support of Putin if there were no censorship of traditional media and internet? That's a different question. And we have estimates of that with Dan Triesman from in one of our papers, and these estimates are catastrophic. So if Putin enjoys, as I showed you, 80% popularity without censorship, this number would be 30. Right? So uh, that, is, that, that is a much more speculative estimate, but it's based on a panel uh, uh, regression with uh, global data on popularity of non-democratic leaders anyway. So censorship mattered, but just given the censorship, the level of support was pretty reliable. Now today, as you rightly say, you shouldn't believe this data. Because today, if this is a security service, they record your answer, you can go to jail for several years. and. Uh, Pollsters don't want to touch list experiments. So there was a list experiment at the beginning of the war which showed that there is a huge bias. Uh, but when I tried to run polls in Russia after the beginning of the war, no single pollster would talk to me. And, uh, and whatever ways I used and I explained to people that it's safe and so on, nobody wants to talk to me. It's extremely hard to get a representative sample and so on and so forth. So anyway, I think we shouldn't trust the polls since the beginning of the war because this is when repression has started. It's like running a poll in Soviet Union or North Korea. 
makes no sense, right? Uh, on uh, the issue of gas, LNG from China. So I think if Putin took Kiev in three days, Chinese comrades would say, great, we love you, you will be under sanctions, but we'll trade with you, you've done a good thing, Free, uh, friendship without limits. But what's happened actually hurt China a lot. Putin failed and he also failed China because China needs jobs. These jobs come from global economic growth. Global economic growth, as I just said, lost a trillion dollars. So for China, this war is also very costly. And so China doesn't have allies. Russia is not an ally of China. China pursues its own interest. If Russia had a big market, China would trade with Russia. Now, Russian market is down, as I said, and so, and so China wants to make its money somewhere else. And that's, that's as simple as that. And uh, if trading with Russia too much is against China's interest, China will not trade with Russia. That's also very, very uh, clear. And Europe pays a lot for LNG, so why not, right? So all of that, all of that is just, just a simple reality that China doesn't like US, US doesn't like China, but uh, if China wants to pursue its interests, it sells expensive stuff to places which pay more. Now, the last question is about how long the war is going to, to last. Now, as I mentioned in the very end, in the previous, uh, in the one by last slide, much depends on how effective Putin's repressive regime. And we don't know, we just don't know. Basically, the uh, calculus is oil sanctions are in place, Putin runs budget deficit, he needs to reduce spending on pensioners by non-indexing pensions, right? Inflation is still 10, 12%. So uh, if you don't index pensions, pensions go down by 10% in real terms. Pensioners are unhappy. Imagine that in Austria, incomes go down by 10%. This government is unlikely to survive much, in, uh, much time in, in office, right? Uh, in Russia, that doesn't happen because you index the salaries of policemen. And so the question is, at what point the number of unhappy pensioners and reasonably unhappy policemen and reasonably unhappy generals who lost the war, um, all of that comes together. And at what point unhappy people around Putin poison Putin? We don't know. And this is extremely hard to predict. Let's assume Putin, is in, uh, Putin uh, continues to be in power. Then the outcome of the war is decided on the battleground. This is a hot war. Yes, there is an energy war. There is a um, disinformation war. This is a food uh, price war. But first and foremost, it's a hot war, and much depends on how much longer Ukraine will be able to fight this war, win this war. I think that if Ukraine completely regains the territory, that will be a major shock for Putin regime, Putin's regime, and Putin's unlikely to survive it for long. However, if, and I'm not a military expert, if Ukraine doesn't have enough tanks to do that, there is uh, an outcome which I think is very likely. The war will continue forever in legal terms, like in Korea. I mentioned Korea already once. There is another analogy of Korea. Uh, North Korea and South Korea don't have a peace agreement. The war is still on. But it's de facto, the war is not there. And Russian-Ukrainian war may become a lower intensity war or low intensity war or frozen conflict if neither side can move either direction. And so much depends where this line is. We don't know, I cannot predict. And uh, then you have in exactly North and South Korea situation where Putin's Russia is under sanctions and uh, Ukraine starts reconstruction. And again, to start real reconstruction, Ukraine needs air defense systems to protect itself from rockets that Putin will continue to launch. Uh, but eventually this is, this is the situation I can see. Now in purely, Monetary terms, I think this regime may last long or it may collapse soon. And again, this is something that I cannot predict. But one thing I would like to emphasize, a lot of people say, well, look, Putin is still in place. The war is still going on. So sanctions don't hurt Putin. But sanctions hurt Europeans. Let's remove sanctions. You also can see who are the people who are saying this. These are the people who before the war supported Putin, the European politicians who were friends of Putin. Some supported Putin uh, for free, some supported Putin because he paid them. But anyway, this argument is false. 
uh, because sanctions did hurt Russian economy. I, sh I, I told you that sanctions against Russian oil did hurt Russian budget. And every billion of dollars that Putin gets is a billion of dollars he spends on recruiting uh, mercenaries, buying Iranian drones, and therefore killing Ukrainians. This is, this is very clear. And so limiting Putin's resources, whether the war continues or not, saves lives. And that's very, very clear from the graphs I tried to show you and, and the revealed preference. In economics, we often say, if Putin says sanctions don't hurt me, this is cheap talk. You need to look at what he does, not what he says. So he said from the very beginning, there'll be no mobilization. Only volunteers will fight this war. In September, he says mobilization. Why? Because previously he had this view that he has unlimited amount of money, he can pay soldiers a lot of money. Finally, he came to a situation where he can't. So he started to force people to go to war. And uh, that shows that he already was started, uh, st started to run out of money, understood that in December he would have even less resources. And this is an impact of sanctions. Now, mobilization makes his regime much less popular, as I said before. And so in that sense, sanctions work, and they will continue to work more, even if the war continues. The war with a lot of money is one thing, the war with less money is another thing. And in that sense, even if the sanctions don't stop the war, de facto or de jure, it doesn't mean that sanctions are not important. Thank you. Before I come to this side of the thing, Robert got some questions online, so. Okay, thanks. So we have a lot of people visiting online, so just a few questions, basically three questions from, from, the, from the chat here. Uh, the first question is, um, well, I, tell, I just read that the question is uh, typed in. The leaders of the Russian Federation has voiced many different political goals, which have changed somewhat due to the military defeats of the Russian army in Ukraine, at Kiev and Kharkiv, as well as in Kherson. Initially, there were two goals, the demilitarization of Ukraine and the denazification of Ukraine. Then the third one, to protect the population of Donbass. The fourth one, to weaken the influence of the United States and NATO. The fifth one, cutting a corridor to Transnistria. The sixth one, the general victory of Russia and its assumption of the, as a role of a global power. Um, the question then is, however, these political goals also conceal with some economic goals. Uh, what economic goals do you think the Russian Federation wants to achieve with this military aggression against uh, Ukraine? Uh, the second question then was, um, you presented the results of the Nevada Center poll, uh, showing that about 80% of the population of the Russian Federation supports the policies, the policies of the president and the leadership of the Russian Federation. So why is the title of your lecture today, The Political Economy of Putin's, of Putin's War in Ukraine and not the political economy of Russian Federation's war in Ukraine. And somewhat related to this question, the third one, um, uh, is it not naive, naive to expect that economic slowdown will work in the absence of any opposition? Thus, is Iranization of Russia the inevitable outcome of the recent situation? So there are some more questions, but I'll stop here at, mm -hmm. at, this, at the moment. <clears throat> right. Uh, I'll be very brief. I think uh, this war is a political, not economic war. There are no economic goals. Uh, everybody understood from the very beginning this war will be very bad for Russian economy. And we now know that uh, uh, the head of Sberbank and the head of Russian Central Bank went to see Putin before the war. And I know these individuals, I can completely visualize how that uh, meeting happened. They did, they occasionally did that. They would go show the slides, make predictions. Their predictions were very dire, but th there was no doubt that uh, the war is going to be bad for Russian economy. And one of the proofs I, can, I, can, I already gave you that <coughs> uh, markets already priced in some major negative impact of the war, even before the war. So everybody understood this would be a bad, uh, bad thing for Russian economy. Maybe some particular oligarchs like uh, well, this, uh, the head of private military company Wagner, Mr. Prigozhin, became much more influential and probably richer, maybe. But for Russia as a whole, it's not, it's not a good thing, this war. Uh, and uh, in, that sense, in that sense, I think uh, there were no economic goals. The main goal of this war 
was to uh, create this rally around the flag effect where Putin would explain, yes, economy is not doing well, but it's time to tighten your belts because we pro need to protect our brothers in Donbass, Kyiv, Kharkiv, and so on. So that worked in 2014. He wanted to replay that. Uh, on um, question about Putin's war or Russian's war, I honestly, I would say that we don't know how many Russians support the war. And it may be that Levada polls showing 80% are correct, maybe not. You can find polls today showing that half of the Russians want the soonest end, finish this war as soon as possible. What that means, we also don't know. That may also mean that they want to nuke Ukraine and finish the war. Who knows? But, uh, but honestly, we don't know. I, I would say we don't know. Uh, there are Russian soldiers who go to kill Ukrainians. Uh, that's clear. Uh, there are Russians who support this war. That's also clear. How many of them? I don't know. And so I wouldn't just speculate. But uh, whenever people say that Russians have a responsibility for the war, this is something I would not deny. Me, myself, I've never, I've never voted for Putin. I've never publicly supported his foreign policy or domestic policy for that matter. As uh, uh, you've said, I, I left Russia because of my disagreements with Mr. Putin. At some point, I actually physically was told that I should leave, and I bought a one-way ticket and left the next day. Uh, yet, I, I know that I bear this responsibility because we did not stop Putin. This is our failure. We uh, had a vision of Russia, which we failed to materialize. Instead, we have Russia, which is killing people around the world, especially in Ukraine. And I, I would not deny our responsibility for this. Um, Iranization, that's completely plausible. <laughs> but if anything, Ir Iran now looks like a democracy compared to Russia. You can protest. Yeah, people get hanged, and I agree with that. Russia still doesn't have capital punishment, even though people get poisoned. Yeah, so that, that is a different story, right? This is this remaining spin dictatorship element. You kill people, but you deny your involvement. Uh, in, in, in our presentations of the book, we sometimes quote C Colonel Gaddafi. Colonel Gaddafi is somebody who started his dictatorship in the 20th century, where brutality was the rule. And he finished his dictatorship in the 21st century, when majority of dictators already used deniable violence, limited violence. And his quote is, well, some, some leaders kill opposition uh, activists by cars, in, a, in car crashes, and deny this. We don't do that. If we execute somebody, we execute on television. So in, in that sense, Iran executes people openly. In Russia, you still don't have that. But people go to jail for 10 years, 20 years, for just saying it's a war. And uh, it's an unjust war. So in that sense, yes, I think uh, Russia will be in between Iran and North Korea, as long as Putin is in power. Let me take some questions on this side. Uh, there are quite a lot. But, but actually, YouTube is still open. This is yeah. pretty striking okay. in Russia. And then the Russian yeah. sovereign fund, how is it invested and can it be used to finance the war? Right. Uh, um, okay. Svoboda, uh, Hannes Svoboda. Yeah. Thank you. Hannes Svoboda, president of the Vienna Institute. My question would be, from the Russian perspective, would it be advisable to have a peace agreement with Putin? Or do you think that for the necessary changes in Russia itself, it would be not a good thing to have an agreement with Putin according um, on, on peace in Ukraine? Just uh, behind on this side, yeah. Anybody else? Uh, thank you very much for your lecture and for all of your efforts uh, to give food for thought on this uh, difficult subjects. Uh, I have the following question. During a recent panel discussion here in Vienna, uh, sociologist uh, Greg Yudin said that uh, he believes that certain sanctions imposed by European Union and European countries, or broadly measures against the Russia, are counterproductive. Uh, some of them are inefficient, and some of them are even counterproductive if the goal is to curb uh, the military aggression. Uh, as an economist, uh, from your point of view, which of the sanctions you believe are efficient, which of the sanctions are inefficient, and which are actually counterproductive? Do you think there's such sanctions? 
in the last row, one last question on this side. <laughs> Thank you then. for the presentation. Um, three, three issues to raise. One is um, short term on the grain security, on food security and inflation. Uh, I mean, this year we are still enjoying the harvest from uh, last year, right? In fact, in 22, the harvest uh, was still good in springtime. But don't you agree that this year uh, the situation will be much difficult? much more difficult given that Ukraine has not been able to harvest more than 40% of their fields. So that's one thing. Second, on the short term um, uh, Russian perspective, the, the population was massive last year and it continues to be so. Um, so the usual immigration was approximately about 400,000 people a year. Now this has been tripled or quadrupled, nobody really knows the numbers. So the human capital loss uh, and the labor force losses will be humongous. So what drives this, I would say, optimistic projections of growth going forward? Third, geopolitical restructuring um, following COVID crisis, which I think accelerated now, it's not only shortening the distances in global value chains, but in fact moving away uh, from China and Russia. So how this would affect global economy going forward, because we will be all at loss now here. Thank you. Thank you, I think <laughs> you have quite a... Excellent, uh, yeah, quite a, quite a bro broad range of questions. So Russian sovereign fund, we assume that uh, uh, Russian sovereign fund is invested in dollars, euros, French francs, yuan and gold. And uh, Russian government said that we had $600 billion uh, and uh, half of that is frozen. Uh, this is not exactly um, what uh, the official reporting on the structure of Russian sovereign wealth fund was. Uh, it was more like two thirds of the fund were in the Western currencies. Maybe some Western currencies are held in non-Western countries in cash, I don't know. Uh, so there is not much transparency. Occasionally you have leaks which show that actually things are even worse than, uh, uh, than we, s we think that less than 300 billion were frozen. Now when you think about uh, yuan and gold, Russian Central Bank is sanctioned. So if Russian Central Bank sells uh, gold to you, and you pay dollars to Russian Central Bank, you get under secondary sanctions. Maybe you do it quietly so US Treasury doesn't know that. So this is very hard to trace what happens to gold holdings and yuan holdings. Chinese banks are very careful. They understand how costly it may be. But maybe there are small Chinese banks. So we don't know, we really don't know. Uh, now, sometimes uh, you hear that Russia has rubles in the Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Now, that is uh, strange because basically Russian Sovereign Wealth Fund is Ministry of Finance. So uh, right now it's talking about uh, reserves, uh, which are 600 billion. But then within those reserves, you have something like 200 billion, which are Ministry of Finance money. So Ministry of Finance has a currency deposit with the Russian Central Bank, which invests in dollars, yuan, and so on. Interestingly, this is a policy which goes back to UCAS times. Sometime in 2004 and 2005, uh, Russian government thought that if Ministry of Finance has foreign holdings, uh, the UCAS shareholders will be able to seize it. And so they did this trick uh, going through Russian Central Bank, right? But anyway, so Ministry of Finance has a currency deposit with the Russian Central Bank. And so if this currency, if this currency is frozen, then Ministry of Finance has a, can be paid in rubles by Russian Central Bank. But this will be rubles, which Russian Central Bank prints. So this is just normal monetary emission. And so that should result in inflation. They already do that a little bit, but if they do it massively, inflation will be a problem. So you, sometimes you hear Russian finance ministry gets money from Russian sovereign wealth fund, so many rubles to finance budget deficit. Okay, but this is the same as Russian finance ministry gets money from Russian central bank to finance the war. So this inflationary financing. Since Russian economy is in a recession, inflation is coming, recession, uh, inflation is coming down. But if you print too much money, probably inflation will pick up. So. On uh, the impact of a peace agreement for uh, Russia, uh, so 
everything I know about evolution of uh, dictatorial regimes, this regime will, under Putin, will not soften whatever happens. So if there is a peace agreement, Putin will not go back to spin dictatorship. He will not uh, suddenly soften domestic political uh, game. So I think uh, uh, if, if there is a peace agreement, Putin will be reassured. Well, depends what you mean by peace agreement. But Putin, if Putin can claim victory, come back to Russians and say, we signed a peace agreement and we got more land and we protected our brothers in Donbass, um, that is a, a sign of success. And so I think exactly because of that, Ukraine will not agree to this and the West will not agree to this. That said, I should re remind you that Ukraine greatly depends on the West today. Militarily, oh, uh, from, we don't know how many soldiers and equipment Ukraine has lost, but probably Ukraine has lost all its tanks. And so whatever tanks they have now are, are either Russian tanks they captured, and they captured more Russian tanks than France has in total. Right? We are talking about numbers which are pretty big. More Russian tanks than Germany has in total. Um, and, uh, and then on top of that, whatever the West gives to Ukraine. And on top of that, there is cash. Ukraine runs a huge budget deficit in the range of 50, 60 billion dollars per year. This budget deficit was in the beginning funded by printing money. Uh, Ukraine was on the brink of macroeconomic disaster. Eventually, we are in an equilibrium where EU, US, G7, member states give money to finance this deficit. And so that continues. This is an unprecedented level of uh, the West giving money to one single country. But it looks like the West understands that it's a bit like 1938, right? You need to win this war or you'll go into 1939. And I know in this country, 39, 38 is a special year already, but uh, the world usually think that uh, uh, if uh, Chamberlain did a different thing, maybe 39 wouldn't have come. So uh, this, is, this is the way I see how Western politicians now are thinking. Now, uh, what is a peace agreement uh, 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 um, acceptable for Ukraine? That's taking back all the land, um, getting reparations, sending war criminals to international tribunals. Putin will not agree to this. Ukraine will not agree to anything else. So I don't see peace agreement de jure. De facto, we may have a ceasefire, low intensity conflict, what have you. So on, on the question of counterproductive sanctions, so I can see how, for example, uh, Visa and MasterCard who don't work with Russian banks, sanctioned or non-sanctioned Russian banks, hurts anti-Putin Russians. I myself occasionally have a situation where a Western bank, a French bank, shuts down my bank account without any explanation or says we will not. So I made a cross-border payment, completely legitimate payment. For two months, I cannot find this money. That happens all the time to any Russian right now. Now, luckily, I do have uh, uh, non-Russian uh, non bank accounts and I, I can survive, but uh, but uh, again, I can understand that Visa and MasterCard don't want to make money in Russia, period. They just don't want to have a situation where their business with Russian banks may eventually help some uh, Russian spies to use a MasterCard to buy a microchip to uh, give it to Russian uh, rocket produ producer to kill Ukrainians. This is a huge reputational risk. And uh, I can see that, and I think those sanctions are just collateral damage. Russians, including anti-Putin Russians, suffer. But if you think about this debate and the debate about Ukrainians who are being killed, as we speak, I think uh, we should accept this collateral damage. There is, this is something, uh, <coughs> something which is difficult to compare, impossible to compare. And yes, I would love to see anti-Putin Russians getting visas, uh, getting uh, welfare benefits in Europe as well, but we should also accept the fact that there, are much, there is much more tragedy going on in Ukraine proper. And the Ukrainians are the victims of the war and Russians not so much. So 
That said, I, I, I tried to talk to Western politicians, and in May I wrote an op-ed for The Economist magazine where I said, uh, Russia will not disappear from the map. Europe, after Putin, will need to talk to Russia, will need to rebuild relationship, and these anti-Putin Russians who now complain about counterproductive sanctions will be Russians who will rebuild Russian democracy. Nobody but them will be able to build a peaceful Russia. So good relationship with anti-Putin Russians is in the interest of Europe and Ukraine. So if you can minimize this collateral damage, you should. But uh, I, I think we should not complain too much about not being able to open a bank account. Uh, since we are in the central bank, I can tell you what happens in France. In France, you come to a, to a French bank and say, I'm Russian, open an account for me. Uh, sometimes banks say, no, we don't want even to talk to you, and we don't want to explain to you anything. Interestingly, you can go to French central bank's website, and there is a letter, a decree, which says, you cannot discriminate Russians. You print it out, you go back to the bank, <laughs> and you say, and you say, uh, your uh, regulator says you cannot discriminate me. So, and it, apparently it works. I know people who actually did that. So, uh, on um, other things, on uh, harvest and food security next year, I think we should worry, but markets seem to be reassured. As I said, grain prices came down. So, risks are there. There are all kinds of risks. Ukraine is an important exporter. Uh, but in the global consumption of grain, uh, half of Ukraine grain production is, uh, is a small shock. It's a manageable shock. And, uh, and moreover, as I said, markets believe that things are not terrible. So, uh, on uh, immigration from Russia and loss of capital, human capital, we don't know how many Russians immigrated. Some of them just don't want to live in a repressive state. Some of them don't see future for themselves in this country, which I can understand. If you want to work for competitive global business, Russia is not a country to be. So if you want a career and you have skills, you should move as soon as possible. And then some people just w don't want to be mobilized and sent to the front. And so they just run away. So that's completely normal. It hits Russian economic growth, sure. For Putin, the priority is to stay in power. And so Putin says, you should leave. It's okay. Please leave. On uh, deglobalization and French shoring, I, I think even before the war, I fully agree with you, there was a trend to French shoring um, where you trade with countries who think like you and will not weaponize trade. And so I think it's bad. But uh, as, an economist, as an economist, I love uh, global trade. I think trade really helps to fight global poverty, to increase welfare. But if you think about uh, the fact that because of interdependence between Europe and Russia, and dependence of Europe on Russian hydrocarbons, Putin thought that he can invade Ukraine, and so many people died, and we lost a trillion dollars of, Russian, of, of global GDP, maybe you want to sacrifice some gains of trade to preserve peace, right? So the, the losses from war are so high that gains of trade may be not that high. And so this is the logic of French shoring. And when treasury officials who write textbooks how trade is good talk about French shoring, I think it's completely normal when we have the war. So, but yes, I would love to see free trade everywhere. But it's just uh, 2022 is not a good, a good year to say that we need to have free trade with countries like Russia. And possibly, in some industries, you don't want to depend on China in certain areas. And in certain cases, you don't want to make sure that China has super advanced technology. So all of these issues, it's a bit above my pay grade in the sense that I, I'm not a security specialist. But I know there are gains of trade, but I also know there are losses of war. And so if there is some probability that deglobalization can prevent war, I, I would rather choose uh, some deglobalization. I'm looking at the governor. Do we overstretch your patience to have another round? Another round of, okay. Uh, so let's take a few from here. One, two, three, four, okay. Please, there, yeah. 
Yeah, hi, my name is David Keinrad from the Federation of Austrian Paper Industries. It was very interesting to hear your expertise on the Russian political economy, but since we're talking about a conflict, it's of course symmetric and there is also a political economy on the European side, and this happens to be where we live and where our business interests lie mostly. So my question to you is, um, how long do you think um, the political economy can balance the uh, impacts of the Russia-Ukraine wars? I, I just want to briefly mention there is, of course, inflation, which is partly caused by supply-side shocks. Um, and I think one effect that we have not really begun to see yet is the refugee wave that is probably going to come to our countries this year. Um, how, um, do, you, do you make a prognosis on this? Because you've been very accurate on the Russian side. You said the sanctions may not be enough to stop Putin. Maybe they're enough to stop the Europeans. Okay, uh, done. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the context of the... No, it's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll go. Uh, how do you assess? Uh, how do you assess the um, uh, Russian industry defense capability to replenish the missile and ammunition stockpiles in the context of the technology sanction? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Okay. No, no. You. You. Okay. It's going. Yeah. Uh, speaking about uh, spin dictatorships, how do you value the role now of Turkey in uh, this uh, in the economical side of this war? Thank okay, you. Okay. Clear. Just behind. Yeah. And then one. One over here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is still the possibility of a favorable outcome for Putin in the war in Ukraine. Uh, at least a stalemate where Russia takes the east and the south of Ukraine and Ukraine is neutralized. Um, what do you think would this mean for the economy of both countries and of course the global <coughs> prospects? And uh, last, uh, another question, there is some speculation that Putin might be mentally or physically ill. Uh, can you comment okay. on this? Probably we can drop that last question here. Yeah. No, yeah. Why not? you want to? Uh, okay. Sure. You have some sure. special insights? Yeah, yeah. sure. Okay. Um, many thanks for your presentation, Sergei. I was uh, wondering if I could ask you to evaluate the, um, the measures taken by the Russian Central Bank from a purely technocratic point of view. Were they just right to the point? Should they have done more or less? And if we were to engage in a counterfactual analysis, uh, what would be the state of affairs had such measures not been taken by the RCB? And perhaps on a, on a more personal level, since you mentioned your personal acquaintance with the people, um, it is reported that both uh, Graf and Nabiulina were opposed to the war, although um, I don't know if this is just purely for economic reasons or also for moral reasons, uh, but I was wondering if, if you know, w did they have an option to resign in protest or did they have a, a duty a burden of, of, of duty to their state and they they felt like you know it was up to them to sort out the mess so we collect Thanks. many more questions but there's one more from the some questions in chat i think mo most yeah. of them have already been answered on uh, well on the impact of immigration on whether the Reconciliation with Russia is possible without a complete defeat of the regime, but I think you have already answered a bit on that, as well as on uh, why the war is still popular, given the, the graphs, but I think earlier mentioned. The only question I think which remains here is, uh, before the war, whether uh, this uh, limited filling of European gas storages by Gazprom uh, was already a warning sign that there is something, a war uh, running down the stage, or was this just kind of putting pressure on, on Europe uh, to accept Nord Stream 2. Uh, so this is one of the questions oh, already okay. mm -hmm. before the war, what happened yeah, yeah, already. Right. Yeah. Okay, uh, so these are, these are excellent questions uh, and they're related to each other. European political economy, inflation, um, cost of energy prices. Uh, so this is pretty much Putin's plan to outweigh, to, to uh, sit out European patients. And basically Europeans are, and Americans, but mostly Europeans are paying this price, uh, helping Ukraine, paying higher price for energy in 2022. Now, as I said, gas prices have come down. Um, but uh, 
Mm, to what extent uh, Putin can hope that eventually uh, there'll be pressure on Zelensky? Now, all Western leaders say Zelensky chooses his own peace deal or no peace deal, that's his policy. But if European leaders uh, stop giving enough money to Zelensky, he's stuck. If they stop giving, if Americans stop giving him military equipment, he's stuck. So uh, currently all leaders say we'll do everything we can, but uh, they, there is still discretion in there. So I don't know. So this is Putin's plan. Regarding refugees, he's been very clear and he is, um, uh, Right-hand side man, Mr. Patrushev, the uh, Secretary of the Security Council, has been very clear that they would like to weaponize refugees. They actually said, well, they didn't weaponize Ukrainian refugees, but they, uh, they, they openly talked about Middle Eastern refugees, North African refugees. So they wanted to weaponize food security crisis, so they would replay 2011 and uh, refugee crisis, uh, Syrian refugee crisis, and therefore they actually said, you'll have a lot of med uh, Mediterranean migration and Europe will collapse. That's what they were talking about. So for them, it's part of the plan as well. Now, <clears throat> there are several th things here. One is European governments understood that they need to help households. And when you look at uh, support packages as percentage of GDP, that European governments gave to households and firms in 2022. It's not the same as during COVID, but it's pretty much similar order of magnitude. In some countries, we're talking about 4% of GDP, in some 7% of GDP. So the government said, we want to bail out. Future generations of taxpayers will pay for this. This is an extraordinary moment. Yes, inflation is bad, but we'll try to, to buffer this somehow. And I think it's smart. Second thing, refugees. Um, Ukrainian refugees are more welcome because they're mostly women and kids. Men are not able to leave. Um, and then on top of that, there is a, a cultural affinity and there is also something that I would openly call racism. Uh, many European uh, journalists would say in the beginning of the war, these are people like us, meaning that they look like us much more than Syrian refugees. And unfortunately for Syrian refugees, but fortunately for Ukrainian refugees, I've seen zero backlash against Ukrainian refugees. If Mr. Patrushev destroyed the uh, Middle East and North Africa and had a few million uh, Middle Eastern refugees, that is a different game. But currently we talk about Ukrainian refugees. It's costly, but there is no cultural backlash against that. Now, another argument you should not forget Yes, there is fatigue. Yes, people start to forget about this war. But every month, Mr. Putin com uh, uh, commits another horrible war crime. And public reawakens and supports Ukraine again. And so in that sense, uh, in that sense uh, I, think, I think so far the equilibrium is the public supports uh, anti-Putin policies and politicians support sanctions. But Putin may win this waiting game. Who knows? So far, I won't say much. On defense industry's potential to uh, reproduce stockpiles, I'm not a specialist on this, I don't know. Uh, so there are some intelligence uh, reports and some military experts who say that we don't know how many more rockets Putin has, but not many more. And uh, each, each uh, week they use about 100 rockets, 100 missiles. <coughs> Um, Ukrainians uh, uh, sh uh, sh uh, can shoot down about uh, 70 or 80 percent of them. And they say that Putin can produce about 100 uh, rockets a year, something like this. So once he's out of stockpiles, the rate will be very different. But uh, nobody knows for sure. Nobody knows. So I cannot really say. And also, people don't know how much he gets from North Korea. So this is not, not, not a question for me. Uh, but the less money Putin has, the fewer rockets he has as well. Okay? And then Turkey. Turkey has played a super important role uh, in the beginning of the war. First, uh, giving drones to Ukrainians. Second, blocking the straits. Putin wanted to send more uh, navy to Black Sea. He could not because Turkey did not allow that and still doesn't allow that. 
So Putin only has Black Sea fleet in the Black Sea without a flagship, famous cruiser Moscow, um, which is now submarine. Uh, uh, so he uses this Black Sea fleet to launch rockets. So if he had three times as many ship, maybe he would launch more rockets as well. So who knows? And maybe he would have taken Odessa, which would have catastrophic implications for all kinds of things. So Turkey has played a very important role there. On the other hand, as I mentioned, Turkey has increased its trade with Russia. Turkey wants to become a gas hub with Russia. Now, we should not forget that Erdogan has an election next year. Uh, today's Turkey is a mix between fear and spin dictatorship. On one hand, there are plenty of journalists who are in jail, plenty of judges who were kicked out, plenty of professors who were kicked out. On the other hand, elections are pretty competitive. He sometimes loses municipal elections. Uh, the country is divided, so it's not clear at all that he will be able to win this election next year, presidential election next year. So he needs geopolitical adventure, he needs economic success. And one of the examples I would give you is victory of Azerbaijan over Armenia. And what's going on right now in Nagorno-Karabakh is something which is, Nagorno-Karabakh is actually blockaded by Azer Azeri troops. And of course, in this war, Turkey is a winner and Erdogan says, we saved our brothers, Azeris. And so this is also something which Erdogan, Erdogan is playing several chessboards at the same time. And his goal is to come back to his voters and say, I am your protector. We win. We are an empire again, and so on and so forth. You remember in this country, uh, uh, there is also a memory of sieges of Vienna by Ottoman Empire. And uh, certain parties actually evoke these memories. Uh, there is actually economics research which shows that in places which were raided during 17th century, 16th century, have more votes for certain right-wing party. So, uh, so Turkish imperial legacy is huge, uh, even in Austria. Okay. Uh, on a favorable outcome uh, for Putin. So I think if Putin keeps, for example, the land he's got now, that's already a victory. And I think this is what he counts for. And uh, if that happens, Russia remains under sanctions. And the future of Ukraine depends on whether Ukraine gets air defense and sufficient uh, amount of troops to hold at least this line. If air defense is there and Putin cannot continue to destroy, rebuild bridges, rebuild uh, cities, that's exactly the South North, North Korean situation. Ukraine starts reconstruction, Russia remains under sanctions. So, uh, and this is what the IMF forecast I, I showed you is pretty much based on. So that's the idea. Yeah, some people ask how Russia can grow without human capital. Well, all kinds of countries grow. Growing at uh, one or 2% for a country like Russia is completely feasible. Growing at 5% or 10% without human capital isn't feasible. But uh, slow growth is possible. Is Putin uh, physically uh, sick or, or, or mentally sick? So I talked to one neuroscientist, and he told me that if you spend two years in isolation, uh, your neurons disconnect and reconnect in a different way. So it may be the case uh, <laughs> that Putin, who's uh, spent two years in isolation, is thinking in a different way. Now, if you talk to psychologists, or cognitive scientists, not, not, if you talk to psychologists or communication scientists, you can also say that if you talk to just one person or 10 people, and you don't talk to people who criticize you, maybe you also have this idea that you're great, your army is strongest, the West is weak, the West just ran away from Afghanistan, the West is disunited, and Ukrainians love you because you spent several billion dollars bribing Ukrainian politicians. Now, people who took billions of dollars to bribe Ukrainian politicians and move this money to Switzerland for their own accounts never expected that there would be a test, <laughs> all right? They didn't expect that Putin would actually launch the war. And people who stole money instead of building modern rockets didn't expect that there would be a war and they, it will be discovered that they actually stole the money. But uh, uh, Putin apparently got this image. Now, th that's very costly. And before answering the question about Gref and Nobulin, it's very costly for some individuals. A lot of Russians fell out of the windows. A lot of Russians died. A lot of high-level Russians 
died under whatever circumstances during, during this year. And there are reports that last week several defense industry leaders actually died, like three people responsible for producing rockets, drones, and so on. So there is certain retribution from Putin. So he understands that certain people didn't deliver. But initially, he probably was in this echo chamber. So this is uh, what we can say. Uh, is he physically sick? We don't know. He doesn't look healthy. He definitely has cancer. The cancer that he has seems to be treatable. Uh, but uh, some people say he has Parkinson. Uh, sometimes you can see, um, you see uh, confirmation of this. He cannot really stay on stage for long hours. He canceled several things which were traditional, like taking calls from Russian citizens for four hours. This thing is not happening anymore. So uh, we don't know. We honestly don't know. But they were investigative journalists who looked at uh, uh, people who traveled with Putin, and they identify a team of oncologists. And so Putin definitely has a cancer. But cancer is not uh, Novichok, right? So um, now talking about uh, central bank on technocratic level, I was surprised how competent these measures were, how they stopped the panic right away. Once again, I would like to emphasize that it's not just central bank, but also riot police, right? So imagine you come to Austrian citizens and say, sorry, your bank deposits are no longer yours. And people take to the street. In Russia, they can't because the first week of the war, it was very clear. You, t you take to the street, I, I, I torture you, I beat you, and I put you in jail for many years. So, so in, that sense, uh, uh, in that sense, it's not just central bank. But central bank did a lot of uh, skillful measures, and they stopped the panic, and the panic was huge. So in that sense, they're very competent. On a personal level, I think uh, for me, it's almost a personal tragedy that people that I knew remained uh, supporting this regime, working for this regime. Some of them are people I knew well, some of them people I worked with, some of them people I taught. So for me, it's actually uh, at the personal level is a tragedy. Now, uh, every billion of dollars that they save for Russian budget is a billion of dollars that Putin uses to kill the Ukrainians. And we know this, and there is no question about this. Now, when these people come back home and look into the mirror, they say, we are here to protect poor Russians from inflation. Without us, there would be a monetary collapse, and so poor Russians will suffer. Uh, now, in the longer run, every billion of dollars that destroys Ukrainian cities is a billion of dollars Russian taxpayers will pay in reparations. Right? And in that sense, in longer term, they're undermining Russian economy. But uh, they need to self-justify, and they, I'm sure they succeed, succeed in this. Uh, reportedly, they, uh, had, uh, they did try to resign, but they did not. Now, in Russia, I think the way it works is if you come to Putin and say, I would like to resign, and he says, no, you can't, that means that you can't, in the sense that he can kill you. And uh, this is, as I mentioned, is not a theory, right? We've seen evidence to this. And so to what extent he actually said that to Nabiulin or not, I don't know. Uh, so I don't know. But uh, she's not left. And I think, honestly, I think if she really wanted to leave, she would be able to leave. Uh, but uh, she didn't. So I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and then uh, 2021 gas uh, market manipulations. I don't know why Putin did that. Uh, was that... Uh, uh, trying to convince Europeans to uh, launch Nord Stream 2, that's possible. And I think we don't know enough about 2021. I remind you that a European Commission even started investigation into market manipulation by Gazprom, whether Gazprom tried to play a game. Was it a game at the level of Putin to push the launch of Gazprom or not, uh, Nord Stream 2 or not? I don't know. But one thing I would remind you, when in September, Nord Stream 1 was blown up and half of Nord Stream 2 was blown up, uh, and we don't know who did that, uh, Mr. Putin's energy minister, Alexander Novak, said, we still have half of Nord Stream 2. Why won't you use this? And, uh, and in, in many ways, Nord Stream 2 is not just a pipeline. It's also a symbolic project for Putin. So I don't know. So I won't, I won't speculate about this. But, uh, but this story is under investigated i fully agree and uh, 
I understand why European Commission is no longer pursuing the story. There are many other things to do, uh, but uh, they actually launched an investigation and just didn't have time to finish it. And I think it was, it was an interesting episode of uh, economic history. Yes, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I think you, in your last slide, you had a lot of question marks. <laughs> so we still end this uh, very informative session with not knowing how the whole thing will end. <laughs> yep. But we had the most knowledgeable person with us today who gave us as much information as we could on how it evolves and what sort of variables play a role in it. And it's obviously something w which would have an inexhaustible supply of further questions. <laughs> and we are very grateful for your uh, information and for you coming here. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for thanks. answering thanks. all the questions. questions. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Lots of questions. Yeah. So.